life before the accident was different. I, Eden, was 19, fiercely independent, and a snowboarding enthusiast. That changed in a heartbeat. After the crash, everything went downhill, not just for me, but for my family too. My mom, Sarah, she's a saint, always there, always caring. But dad, well, he's a piece of work. Self-centered doesn't even begin to cover it. It was just another ordinary evening at home, me in my wheelchair by the window, mom reading in her chair, and dad. Dad was late, as usual. The tension was a thick fog in the room, even before he burst through the door with that grin plastered across his face. The kind of grin that made you want to leave the room. Guess what? Dad bellowed, throwing his coat onto the sofa, not caring where it landed. Mom looked up, weary. What is it, Mark? Old man's finally kicked the bucket. He exclaimed, practically jumping with joy. I felt my heart drop. He was talking about grandpa, mom's dad. How could he be so cruel? Mom's face drained of color. Mark, how can you say that? He was my father. Oh, come off it, Sarah. We both know I only married into this family for the cash. And now, with him gone, we can finally get our hands on it," Dad retorted, his voice sharp. Mom stood up, her voice steady, but ice cold. You owe him an apology. He was a good man, and you've never given him the respect he deserved. Dad just laughed, that harsh, grating sound. Respect? For that old coot? Never loved him, never loved you. It's always been about the money. I couldn't stay silent. Dad, how can you be so heartless? He turned to me, his eyes cold. And you? What use are you? Can't even stand on your own two feet. Tears pricked my eyes, but I wouldn't let him see them fall. Mom moved to my side, her hand warm on my shoulder. Don't listen to him, Eden. You're stronger than he'll ever be. But the words had already sunk deep, leaving a scar that felt as physical as the one on my spine. The room was thick with tension, a silent battleground. Dad's phone rang, and he answered with a laugh, turning his back on us. Yeah, he's finally gone. Party at mine this weekend. Bring the good stuff. Mom sighed, her eyes meeting mine with a sadness that mirrored my own. Let's go to bed, Eden. There's nothing for us here. As we left Dad to his call, I couldn't help but feel a piece of our family die with Grandpa. Dad's joy at his passing was a poison, one that threatened to consume what little love was left in our home. The next day was no better. Dad was gone before we woke, probably off to celebrate his newfound freedom. Mom tried to smile over breakfast, but it didn't reach her eyes. We'll get through this, Eden. Together, she said, squeezing my hand. I nodded, forcing a smile. Together. As the days turned to weeks, the house felt more like a prison. Dad's presence loomed large, even in his absence. The joy he felt at Grandpa's death was a clear message, he was in charge now, and we were just living in his world. After Grandpa's funeral, our house became a war zone. Dad's mask was off, his true nature, unchained. The air was thick with disdain, especially towards me. My wheelchair seemed to be a trigger for him, a symbol of something broken he couldn't stand. One evening, the atmosphere at dinner was more suffocating than usual. Mom tried to keep things light, but you could cut the tension with a knife. So, how was your day, Mark? Mom asked, her voice a bit too cheerful. Dad snorted, shoveling food into his mouth. Same old, but better knowing there's one less leech sucking my wallet dry. Mom's fork paused midair. Mark, please. Can we not do this tonight? He glared at her, then at me. Oh, I'm sorry. Are we pretending the freeloader isn't sitting right here? I felt my cheeks burn, my hands clenching into fists under the table. I'm right here, Dad. You don't need to talk about me like I'm not. He laughed, a sound that made my skin crawl. Oh, now the cripple speaks up. What are you gonna do, huh? Race me? Mom stood up, her chair scraping back. Mark, that's enough. He just raised an eyebrow, challenging her. 
Or what? You'll leave me? Please. We both know you'll be lost without me. The words stun, not because they were true, but because they were meant to hurt. Mom sat down, defeated. Dinner continued in silence, each bite tasting like ash. A few days later, Lisa, the new nurse, arrived. From the get-go, I knew something was off. Her smile was too tight, her eyes cold. Nice to meet you, Eden, she said, her voice dripping with something I couldn't place. Was it disdain? Pity? Yeah, sure, I replied, not in the mood for pleasantries. As the days passed, her accidents became more frequent. A cup of tea slipped from her hands, drenching my lap. Oh, my bad, she'd say, her apology as fake as her smile. One afternoon, I was trying to navigate through the living room, and she was supposedly helping. Oops, she exclaimed as my wheelchair suddenly jerked, sending me crashing into a side table. Lisa, what the hell? I shouted, pain shooting up my arm. Oh, sweetie, I'm so sorry. It was an accident, she cooed, but her eyes told a different story. Mom walked in at that moment, her face clouded with worry. What happened? Lisa happened, I said, my voice tight with anger. Mom turned to Lisa, her gaze stern. This needs to stop. Now. Lisa put on her best innocent face. I really didn't mean to, Sarah. It was an accident. But the incidents didn't stop. If anything, they got more brazen. Lisa driving my wheelchair too close to the edge of the stairs, forgetting to lock the wheels when she left me in a room. I told mom about each one, and each time, she confronted Lisa. But dad, he wouldn't hear of it. One evening, I overheard them arguing about it. She's a hazard, Mark. She's hurting our daughter, mom was saying, her voice laced with desperation. Dad's laugh echoed through the house. Oh, please. Eden's just jealous, because Lisa can walk, and she can't. The girl's doing her job, and she's staying. I felt a lump form in my throat. His words were like a slap in the face. I was at a loss, trapped in a toxic home where my disability was seen as a burden, and my safety was a joke. Weeks turned into a never-ending cycle of silent suffering and whispered secrets in our house. Lisa, the nurse, continued her reign of thinly-veiled cruelty towards me, all while Dad turned a blind eye. I couldn't fathom why Dad allowed her to stay, her presence like a constant shadow darkening our already troubled home. That was until I caught them, Dad and Lisa, in an embrace that left no room for doubt. They were kissing in the living room, so wrapped up in each other, they didn't notice me. My heart stopped. It wasn't just the proximity, it was the intimacy of it, the shared secrecy. I reversed my wheelchair, the sound loud in the silence. Lisa spotted me first, her eyes widening in panic. Dad turned, his expression morphing from surprise to irritation. What are you looking at, he snapped. I couldn't find my words. Betrayal choked me, rendering me silent. Nothing. I finally managed, retreating to my room, their laughter echoing behind me. I had to tell mom. She deserved to know, even if it shattered her world as it did mine. When I did, her reaction was calmer than I expected, a quiet storm brewing behind her eyes. This will come back to haunt him, she said, her voice low, but determined. I wasn't sure what she meant then, but I soon noticed the visits from a man who looked like he had seen his fair share of the world, his demeanor screaming former cop. He and mom would spend hours locked away in her office, talking in hushed tones. I clung to the hope that these meetings spelled a change, a way out of the misery dad and Lisa had plunged us into. But before anything could materialize, tragedy struck like lightning. Mom was in an accident, the kind that leaves a void that can never be filled. The news hit me like a physical blow, my world crumbling around me. What devastated me even more was dad's reaction, or the lack thereof. At mom's funeral, he was almost jubilant, whispering and laughing with Lisa as if they were at a party, instead of mourning the loss of a wife and mother. I couldn't hold back my anger when I saw them together, their glee a stark contrast to the sorrow engulfing me. How can you be like this? At mom's funeral? 
I hissed at dad when I got a moment alone with him. He shrugged, his cold eyes meeting mine. Life goes on, Eden. Your mother wouldn't have wanted us to stop living, now would she? The words felt like a slap, his indifference a blade twisting in my heart. But it was his next actions that showed his true colors. Clutching Lisa close, he announced to anyone within earshot that they were planning to marry, that it was what my mother would have wanted. I stood there, a mix of grief and disbelief washing over me. The man who was supposed to be my protector, my guide, was nothing more than a heartless stranger, celebrating his newfound freedom at the expense of my mom's memory. The house felt colder after mom's funeral, like all warmth had left with her. Dad and Lisa, they didn't even pretend to mourn. It was business as usual for them, maybe even a bit cheerier, if you can believe it. A week had passed, and the air was thick with unsaid things. Dad called a family meeting, which was a joke, really. Just me, him, Lisa, and Uncle John and Aunt Marie who had come down to help with everything. We were all sitting in the living room, the tension palpable. Uncle John looked like he was gearing up for a fight, Aunt Marie's hand on his knee was the only thing keeping him in check. Dad cleared his throat, a smug look on his face. I've got news, he started, glancing at Lisa with a smirk. Lisa and I, were getting married. Aunt Marie gasped, Uncle John's face turned red. You can't be serious, Mark. After everything that's happened? Dad's smirk widened. Oh, I'm dead serious. And there's more. Eden. He turned his gaze to me, that cold, heartless look making my blood freeze. You're going to a state institution for the disabled. We can't take care of you anymore. My heart stopped. What? You can't just decide that for me. I'm not going. He laughed, a sound that made my skin crawl. And who's gonna stop me? You? Don't be stupid. You're a beggar and an invalid. No one needs you. Uncle John stood up, his face a mask of fury. That's enough, Mark. She's staying with us. We'll take care of her. Dad looked genuinely surprised for a moment before regaining his composure. Fine. Take her. It's not like she's any use to me anyway. I was in shock, the words, the betrayal, it hurt more than I could express. Aunt Marie came to my side, wrapping an arm around me. Don't listen to him, sweetheart. You're coming with us, she whispered, her voice soothing. Dad and Lisa exchanged a look, their plan clearly unraveling. But instead of arguing, Dad just shrugged. Suit yourself. But don't come crawling back when you realize what a burden she is. Uncle John was about to lunge at Dad, but Aunt Marie held him back. Not worth it, she muttered, her eyes on me. We left shortly after, the silence in the car only broken by Aunt Marie's occasional attempts to lighten the mood. Uncle John drove like a man possessed, his anger palpable. Once we arrived at their place, Uncle John turned to me, his expression softening. Eden, your family. And family sticks together, no matter what. That man, he couldn't even bring himself to call dad, is no family of ours. Aunt Marie nodded, taking my hand. We'll figure this out, honey. You're safe with us now. That night, lying in a strange bed in Uncle John and Aunt Marie's guest room, I couldn't help but replay Dad's words in my mind. A burden. Unwanted. But then I'd remember Uncle John and Aunt Marie's kindness, and a sliver of hope pierced the darkness. Maybe, just maybe, things could get better from here. Adjusting to life at Uncle John and Aunt Marie's felt like breathing fresh air after being underwater for too long. In their home, my wheelchair wasn't a barrier, it was just part of me. They never made it feel like a big deal, and for that, I was endlessly thankful. A week had barely passed when my world took another sharp turn. Dad showed up out of nowhere, looking a mess. His eyes were desperate, his clothes disheveled. He blurted out news that felt like a punch to the gut, Mom's will had left everything to me. The house, the money, it was all mine now. Turns out, mom had a detective on her tail, before she passed, the same guy I'd seen sneaking around. He had dug up dirt on dad and Lisa, 
enough to block Dad from getting his hands on any inheritance. Dad tried to play on my sympathies, saying things like, You don't need all that money. What's a girl in a wheelchair gonna do with it? Just give it to me. Uncle John lost it at that. Get out of my house, he roared, standing up so fast his chair nearly toppled over. You've got some nerve, showing up here and spewing that garbage. Dad was shown the door, literally. Uncle John made sure of it, his anger a clear warning against coming back. The decision to move back into my childhood home was bittersweet. Uncle John and Aunt Marie insisted on coming with me, making sure everything was still in place for my return. The house had been modified years ago to accommodate my wheelchair, so navigating the familiar spaces brought a surge of memories. Rolling through each room, I couldn't help but feel the presence of my mom. This was where we had laughed, cried, and shared our lives. Now, with the house officially mine, I felt her absence more keenly than ever. Uncle John broke my reverie. What do you think, kiddo? Ready to make this place your own again? I nodded, feeling a mix of sadness and determination. Yeah, I am. It's going to be different, but I think mom would have wanted me to have a fresh start here. Aunt Marie smiled, her warmth enveloping the room. She'd be proud of you, Eden. We all are. And remember, we're just a phone call away. As they helped me settle in, I thought about dad's words, his attempt to diminish me because of my disability. But sitting in my home, surrounded by love and support, I realized his words couldn't touch me anymore. I was more than my wheelchair, more than the limitations he tried to impose on me. This house, my inheritance, wasn't just about the money or the property. It was a testament to my mom's love and foresight. It was a safe haven, a place where I could start anew, building a life on my terms. Thanks, Uncle John, Aunt Marie. For everything, I said, my voice steady with newfound resolve. I'm not sure what the future holds, but I'm ready for it. With or without Dad. They shared a look, a silent agreement, then Uncle John said, That's the spirit, Eden. You're gonna do great things. We believe in you. The house felt different that evening, not just a structure of brick and mortar, but a home filled with possibilities and dreams waiting to be realized. For the first time in a long time, I felt genuinely hopeful about the future. A few weeks had settled into a new kind of normal at the house. Aunt Marie decided to stay with me for a bit, helping me out and keeping me company until we found the right nurse. It was nice, having her around. Made the big, old house feel warm again. One lazy afternoon, we were in the kitchen, Marie flipping through a cookbook, when we heard a car pull up. We glanced at each other, both of us tensing up. When we saw it was Dad and that nurse of his, Lisa, my heart sank a bit. But I was determined to face them, to show I wasn't the same person they'd left behind. Dad knocked, his face all desperate when I opened the door. Lisa stood behind him, her arms crossed, looking everywhere but at me. Can we talk? Dad's voice was softer than I remembered, but I could still hear the selfishness underneath. I nodded, out of some old respect or maybe just curiosity. All right, talk. He started rambling about how hard things had been since they left, how he'd racked up debts, thinking he'd get a piece of mom's inheritance. Lisa just rolled her eyes, like she'd heard this sob story too many times. And now, well, we've got nowhere decent to stay. I was thinking, maybe we could come back here. He trailed off, looking hopeful. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. After everything, he thought he could just waltz back in? I felt Aunt Marie's hand on my shoulder, a silent sign of support. No. I said, stronger than I thought I could. You made your bed, now lie in it. Dad's face fell, and for a moment, I almost felt sorry for him. Almost. As they turned to leave, Dad and Lisa started arguing right there in my driveway. It was like watching a trashy TV show live. I want those jewels back, the ones I gave you. Dad shouted, his voice cracking with desperation. Lisa laughed, harsh and loud. As if, why would I give anything to a broke old man? You promised me a life of luxury, not debts. 
Aunt Marie and I watched from the doorway, not even trying to hide our interest. It was a mess, but it was also a kind of closure. Seeing them like that, at each other's throats over the very things that had torn our family apart, I felt a weight lift off me. I turned to Aunt Marie, who had a small smile on her face. Let's go back inside, I said. I've had enough drama to last a lifetime. She nodded, and we closed the door on that chapter of our lives for good. That night, Aunt Marie and I sat in the living room, a sense of peace between us. The house felt different now, like it was really mine. Our laughter echoed through the rooms, filling the space with new memories. I'm proud of you, kiddo. Aunt Marie said, her voice warm. Your mom would be too. I smiled, looking around at the home I was beginning to rebuild. Thanks, Aunt Marie. I think I'm finally starting to feel like myself again. The path ahead wasn't going to be easy, but with Aunt Marie by my side and the memory of my mom's strength guiding me, I knew I could face anything. Sweet justice, indeed, but also a fresh start. Life after Dad and Lisa's showdown felt like turning over a new leaf. Aunt Marie stayed with me, her presence a constant comfort as we navigated my new reality together. We were in the thick of interviewing nurses, trying to find someone who wasn't just qualified, but also a good fit personality-wise. One afternoon, we sat in the living room with a candidate named Jenna. She was young, around my age, with a bright smile and an easygoing manner that made me like her almost instantly. So, why nursing? Aunt Marie asked, getting straight to the point as she always did. Jenna leaned forward, her hands clasped. I've always wanted to help people. To make a real difference, you know? And after my granddad got sick, I realized this is how I could do it. I nodded, impressed by her sincerity. What about working with someone in a wheelchair? Any experience with that? Jenna nodded eagerly. Yes, actually. I volunteered at a rehab center during college. It's about making life easier, more enjoyable. I believe in focusing on what people can do, not what they can't. Aunt Marie and I exchanged a look, a silent agreement passing between us. We'll let you know soon, Aunt Marie told her as the interview wrapped up. But I had a good feeling about Jenna. After Jenna left, Aunt Marie turned to me, a smile playing on her lips. Well, what do you think? I smiled back, feeling more hopeful than I had in a long time. I like her. She seems, right. The decision to hire Jenna was a turning point. She wasn't just a nurse, she became a friend. Someone who laughed with me, not at me. Who saw beyond the wheelchair. One day, Jenna and I were in the garden, enjoying the afternoon sun. I was telling her about my plans for the place, how I wanted to make it more accessible, to maybe even start a small garden of my own. Jenna was all in. That sounds amazing, Eden. Count me in. I might not have a green thumb, but I'm a quick learner. Aunt Marie watched us from the kitchen window, a satisfied smile on her face. Later, she joined us outside, bringing out a pitcher of lemonade. To new beginnings, she toasted, raising her glass. Jenna and I echoed the sentiment, our glasses clinking in the golden afternoon light. Months have rolled by since I took back control of my life. I've even started taking online courses to continue my education, not letting my wheelchair define what I can or cannot do. I decided to give a chunk of the inheritance from my mom and grandpa to a foundation that helps folks in wheelchairs get back on their feet, so to speak. It feels good, you know? Making a difference, giving back in a way that feels personal to me. As for dad, last I heard, he's scraping by, working jobs he once would have turned his nose up at. The high life he once lived, all that charm and polish, it's gone. People barely recognize him now. And it's not like I get a kick out of hearing about his downfall. It's more like it's confirmed something I've come to believe, karma's real. It catches up to everyone eventually, serving up exactly what they deserve. Living with this mindset, I found a kind of peace. I'm focusing on my studies, my recovery, and working on making my home, and maybe even the world, a bit better for people like me. Jenna and I, we talk a lot about the future, about plans and dreams.
It's funny, not too long ago, I couldn't picture a future worth looking forward to. We're doing good, aren't we, Jenna? I asked her one evening as we sat in my newly accessible garden, a project we tackled together. Better than good, Eden. You're smashing it. She replied with that cheeky grin of hers. It's moments like these that remind me how far I've come. From feeling trapped in a life I didn't want, to building one that feels right. My journey's had its share of ups and downs, but here I am, moving forward, wheelchair and all.